If you want me to narrate your story, first you've got to send it over at darkstories.org. I'd love to hear more of the classics, such as finding strange and dangerous things in the woods and encountering creatures beyond our nightmares. I'll be back soon with a normal-sized video. Until then, enjoy this one that I wrote. Don't leave the campfire. Went camping in a cold, damp national park in the Northwest United States. I'm used to going camping alone, hiking alone. Never been good around people. I'd take my dogs, Tex, a big German shepherd, and Gruff, my old geriatric pug. Gruff could barely see four feet in front of him, never wandered too far from me. But Tex was pretty darn independent but he was scared of the woods. He was a big dog, and the way he'd hug up against my legs as we walked the trails made it difficult to hike. Tex did love the vistas, though. Once the woods opened up into clearings or cliffs, he'd always be excited. He just didn't like those trees and shadows, I guess. But those two ain't around anymore, and I don't go hiking anymore. Let me tell you why. Might be best to click away now if you ain't a fan of animals getting hurt. Let me get back to how I was camping in a cold, damp national park in the northwest United States, specifically in the Rockies. It was close to winter and was as cold as you'd imagine. I'd bought Tex and Gruff the coziest little vests I could find and I made sure we stayed real close to a big campfire by the tent. I couldn't do as much hiking as I wanted. A cold front had me thinking we'd probably call it quits early. We kept the tent set up close to the fire. Tex was asleep in the tents under some blankets he'd snuggled into, and Gruff was sniffing around the site, seeing what sort of smells he could find. I kept an eye on him. His sense of smell was as good as ever, far as I could tell, but he was nearly blind and might wander off too far. Not because he wanted to, but because he wasn't too sure where he was going. I lay back on a wad of blankets, starting to doze off myself. Gruff snorted. I raised up and looked at him. Gruff had lost his bark years ago. Now all he could do was sort of grunt and snort. Couldn't hear it from a different room had we been back at the house, but out here in the dead of night, it was clear as crystal. Looking over, he was just sitting there, peering into the woods. What you see, boy? I asked, not actually expecting an answer the way dog owners do. I'm not sure he heard me, though. He didn't react. Kept staring into the dark. Tex whimpered behind me, apparently awake now. Nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard it. I looked toward him, and he was scurrying backward into the tent wall. What the heck? I looked toward the darkness now, too, wondering what these dogs were seeing or sensing that I couldn't. Started thinking about dogs' visual range. They see through the dark better than we can. Imagining a possum that I couldn't see... Waddling through the dark nearly had me laugh. Gruff was curious, and Tex was a big baby, just like always. But then Gruff got back up on his back legs, seemed curious, and he began to walk forward. Gruff, no, I called to him. He knew better than to go too far. A quick reminder should do the trick. But he ignored me. So I called again. Gruffy, get back here. I began to pick myself up to go and carry him back. Gruff went further forward, paw by paw, until the light from the campfire couldn't reach him. The next thing I knew, there was a muffled yelp, the sound of something big swatting or slapping at the ground. My eyes shot over toward that direction. I'd only looked away for a moment to pick myself up, and Gruff was gone. Only thing left was a cloud of dirt that had been kicked up. I swallowed hard. 
felt as if my heart was rising up in my throat. I felt mad, too, but also scared. Where was my dog? Tex was going mad, then, clawing desperately at the back of the inside of the tent, trying to rip a hole through it. Tex, no! Lay down! I tried to command him to calm down. He wasn't having it. Started using his teeth on the nylon. I was panicking, too. Had no idea what to do or where Gruff had gone. I tried to crawl over to Tex, slowly. Thought I could pet him and ease him into letting me leash him up to one of the stakes. Then I could go look for Gruff and bring him back. I placed my hand on his back. But then Tex snaps, yelping and digging his teeth into my hand before continuing to gnaw at the tent. I fall back, cursing. I looked at my hand, and he had drawn blood. The heck was wrong with him? He had never attacked me before. Matter of fact, I'd never seen him bite another living thing like that. He then tore through the fabric after a few more seconds. I couldn't stop him. He tried to jump through the hole then, but as he did, a similar smack or swatting sound echoed from just outside the tent. Tex's body went limp. I couldn't see more than his lower half because the rest of him was already outside the tent because he was trying to escape. Tex, come here, boy. Y you okay? I called over to him. Suddenly, his body was yanked through the hole entirely, unimaginably fast. Bile rose in my throat. Soon I realized I was choking rather than breathing. I crawled instinctively closer to the campfire. The forest around me was silent. There were bugs chirping and wind blowing through the trees, but nothing else. No sign of movement around the campsite. No sign of anything wrong, except for my two missing dogs. I quickly crawled over to where Gruff had gone, fumbling my phone out of my pocket turning on the flashlight. I followed Gruff's little paw prints until they stopped. Where he had disappeared was the set of thick indentations in the dirt. It reminded me of something. I placed my hand, palm down in the dirt beside me, squeezing some dirt in my hand and lifting it up. The shapes I left in the dirt below looked the same, but way smaller. It was as if a far larger hand had done the same thing to my dog. To both dogs. Out of breath, I circled the camp with the light, pointing it in every direction, but there was nothing but trees. It didn't make sense. I turned off the flashlight and dialed my wife. She didn't answer. Two times, three times, a dozen times I called. No answer. Then I dialed 911. The operator picked up. I informed them that I was in the Rockies. Someone attacked and possibly killed my dogs and might still be out there trying to hurt me. But then a familiar tone sounded in my ear. I looked at the phone screen and a phone brand logo was animating. My phone had died. It was shutting down. I cursed under my breath several times crawling again, not sure why I was too scared to stand up, as I tried to find my backpack. I soon find it, but I can't find my mobile charger, which was supposed to be in there. No, 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 I think. I left it at home, didn't I? I stayed close to the fire then, not blinking for minutes at a time, my head like a sprinkler shifting back and forth, back and forth, ready for anything to emerge from the dark and come right at me. But it never did. I stayed in the same spot, trying not to doze off. It blew my mind that my body was still trying to fall asleep after seeing something like this. The fire behind me was dying down to embers and orange coals. Then I hear movement. My heart rate spikes up again. I look up. Something shoots right past me, landing in front of me at the edge of the firelight. It's an owl, thank God. I can see it more clearly, 
my eyes have adjusted pretty well, and the moon shining through the canopy was a godsend. The owl looks at me with those big eyes, not sure what it was doing down here until I noticed a mouse struggling between its talons. I guess it wasn't in too much of a hurry to fly back up and have that snack. I watched as the mouse broke free from the owl. The owl's head turns and follows the mouse as it runs towards the darkness. The owl's wings open up as it awkwardly pursued the rodent, and then smack. I see it this time. It's much closer than Gruff had been when it happened. A massive hand came down, pointed at the tips like claws. It swept up the bird and mouse, both, before pulling away. This hand was attached to a long, spindly arm with tiny, sharp offshoots, and attached to that was a thin and a rigid body. This body pulls the hand inwards until there's a nearly inaudible crunching sound. Then the silhouette of the thing goes motionless. I realized then that the outline of the creature looked perfectly like a tree in the dark. I was panicking all over again. There were trees everywhere. There could be many of those things everywhere around me. Or if there was one, that I might lose track of it, and it could be anywhere. I stopped and took a breather. I had another realization. That thing seemed to only reach for things away from the fire. I couldn't leave. I was trapped here. I had to get the fire going again, too, before it died out completely. But I could not venture into the forest for what. I glanced over to my blankets and backpack in the tent. I did what I had to do. The pack and fabrics made a billow of smoke as they blazed, but they stayed lit for far longer than I expected. I managed to keep the fire blazing until sunrise. When the sun was shining in full force, I picked myself up, didn't grab anything except for my dead phone, and I scanned the tree line. All the trees looked like trees. That was enough for me to break into a full-on run, and I didn't stop until I was forced to collapse on one of the trails. And there I was found by some hikers. People like me. Or, rather, people who had no idea what sort of nightmares actually lurk in those woods. I managed to make it out, unsure of what I'd seen, vowing never to go back. When I made it home, I cried, letting my wife know that something out there had attacked and killed our dogs. When she asked what it was, I told her my honest truth. I don't know. But I'll let you know that if you're ever in the Rockies, you find yourself out there after dark. Stay by the campfire. And don't let it die out. <laughs>